And you know what you're doing? Nope. I got it. Huh? I got it. She got it. She got it. <coughs> All right. I think this is going to be our uh, last warm day for a little while, isn't it? It's going to be a pretty day, though. Well, I, uh, I, I'll probably teach another lesson next week, but I think this is probably going to be the last chapter in this book on You Are the Lie of the World. So uh, I, I, this morning I was thinking about time and uh, thought I would just talk about time a little bit. So I'm glad all of you were on time. <laughs> you know, several years ago we had a friend, and he's still my friend, Tom Willis. I don't know if any of y'all remember him. Y'all remember Tom? Tom... Uh, uh, would come late to everything. I mean, he just, <laughs> I don't know how he did it on his job, but he, at one time I was talking to him about it because he would, church would start and they would, you know, maybe he was going to teach that Sunday and he just wouldn't be there and he wouldn't be there. And I thought, well, you know, because I'm a, I'm a manuscript preacher. I mean, I can get up and talk. You guys know that. But, and so he finally, I said, Tom, you got to start being on time. And he said, Roy, t- time is no more. And I said, what do you mean? In the book of Revelation, it talks about that, but it doesn't say time is no more. It said time should be no more. Uh, And the word should is actually exist. But, you know, so he he just had this concept that uh, time shouldn't hinder us, which I didn't quite understand what he was talking about. So I kind of resisted that a little bit, you know, but uh, but you do need to be on time if you're going to work or if you've got something to do. And as I said last week and on several other times to you guys, um, I do not believe time was made for man. I believe time was made for the planet, and I showed that to you last week. If you haven't seen that, I encourage people to go back and look at it. Hi, Teresa Ferguson. Uh, So uh, in this last chapter, and like I said, I'll probably teach it again next week, and I may go on, I'm not sure, but I want to discuss how as the light of the world, we have no real boundaries and we have no real barriers. I mentioned that last week, too. But, of course, we have them in our conscious awareness. We all have those things in our conscious awareness. And there's always things that we wrongly think about and we give them a power, right? So we do we not give time a power? I mean, I talk to my kids all the time, uh, my adult children that work a lot. And they're, they often talk about, I just don't have enough time, you know. And you hear people say all the time, and I bet you every one of us have said it, I don't have enough time. Or there's not enough time to do what I want to do. You know, sometimes we'll ask maybe somebody if they could do something for us. And what do they say? I don't, I'm sorry, but I don't have the time. And so we literally have given time a power in our lives tremendously. And we, we, we have this in our conscious awareness, but they're basically illusions brought on by the collectives, collectiveness of mankind. The way people always live. It's the way we've always done it. And, you know, we, we think, well, we only have 24 hours in the day and we only have... 30 days in a month and we only have 12 months and we only, you know, in a year and then on and on and on. And then we even wrongly think that we have only so many years to live. You know, uh, Brother Hibbard used to, uh, where it talked about God would, God would strive with man for uh, 120 years. Well, he, he took that literal and he believed that God promises that we could live for 120 years. But like I've said many times, that could be Jubilee years, and Jubilee years are 50 years each, so that'd be 6,000 years or whatever. So, But still, we, we've done those things, and we wrongly believe that we are finite, and we're not. We're infinite. That's what Scripture teaches. If I'm, in, if I'm in union with an infinite one, which is God, which is breath, which is spirit, whatever you want to call our Creator, if I'm in union with our Father, then there, uh, our Father is eternal. There is no time whatsoever. And so uh, there are relatively few people who seek to rise above what is infinite, to live and move and have our being out of the infinite. And uh, there again, I understand because we haven't believed it. We haven't seen it. We haven't seen anybody yet that could live and not die. But we saw Jesus. I mean, we didn't see him with our eyes, but history very much tells us that Jesus uh, took his body out of that grave and entered back into the breath of God and the the spirit of being or whatever. And history has talked about Jesus appearing to other people. You know, I've done a lot of research on it. I've seen a lot of history that that talks about how Jesus has appeared and other people have appeared who have mastered living 
out of the realm of time and living in the breath of God, you know, and, and I'm not teaching these things so we can all strive to do that. You know, I'm not trying to live forever, <clears throat> but I know if my father created man to live forever, then I believe I'll live forever. If my body ceases to be able to hold me, I'll still be alive. But I still believe that we don't have to, our bodies don't have to wear out with sickness and disease and poverty and mental illness and all that other stuff because that's not how we were created. That something came to us again from the collective, collectiveness of mankind. The Apostle Paul gave a discourse <clears throat> uh, on Mars Hill. It's a place called Mars Hill. He was speaking to very intellectual people. That's the, you know They were the Greeks and different people, and they spoke different languages, and they studied different sciences and everything. And they worshipped all kinds of gods. They had statues all over the place, all these different kind of uh, mythological gods, but they had one that they made to the unknown God because they just wanted to make sure that they were worshiping the unknown God just in case there was another God. And so Paul, huh? To be covered. To be covered, right. That's why we see some of these funny shows where we'll see people wear a, a cross and, a, and a, uh, the Star of David and then all those other. Remember the, the, the one about the out in the desert and this guy was this monster was coming after him he just kept holding different ones up maybe this one will work maybe this maybe if we can pray this kind of prayer and stuff so we have been funny have we not even in christianity i'm just sure our father would just have to laugh at some of the stuff that we've done but paul informed these people that father is not far off and i wish somebody would have taught me that when i was younger because i always sought a god way out there somewhere on a planet that was awful big that he could reach me and he could touch me, but I couldn't reach him, right? And when I say him, I really don't put, want to put a gender there, but that's just what we say. But he, he said that in a relation of rest with our Father, ourselves, then we can live and we can move and we can have our being, for we are caused to be the, the, the uh, generated, if you would, from Father God, and we can rest in that. I was telling Larry last week, we were fishing and he said something about our being and it just triggered, it jumped off in my head. And I told you I was going to look that word up, being, and I figured that it would mean what it exactly means. Uh, it's the word es, uh, es, esmen, -E and it means first person plural, and it means we are, and that comes from the root word I me, which is I exist. So we live and move and exist or have our existence in and of God. And yet man has sought their existence everywhere in the world, right? Everywhere but their, their creator. So therefore we are the plural of, or we exist as the ageless one. Because with Father God, there is no age. With the breath of God, with, if you can still say spirit if you want to, in, in, the, in that realm, there is no age whatsoever. There, there is no time whatsoever. So I've stated oftentimes, uh, we should not, uh, time should not have an effect or an effect on us whatsoever. And because we are of the ageless one. The thing is, we got to do, we've got to agree with that because it's very difficult when we look with our natural eyes and we look around this room and we only see one person in here that's not yet 20 years old. <laughs> you know, he's very young, but then we look and we see what age has done to us, right? And we see the hindrances of what age has done to us. But see, those are effects and those are effects that should not affect an ageless person whatsoever. Just like poverty should not affect a wealthy person, right? But yet you can find wealthy people that live as though they're in poverty because of a mental illness or something. They don't know what belongs to them or maybe they got tired of it, whatever it is. And so it's, it's, it's wrong. So the human-minded concept of time is self-evident, right? It's very self-evident. Everywhere you go, you hear people talking about time. Uh, an hour consists of a certain number of minutes, you know, 60 minutes, right? A, a day uh, of hours, a year of days. And so the passing of time is really closely connected to the concept of space, if you would. And according to general theory of, of uh, relativity, spa of space or the universe, you know, they say that it emerged in a Big Bang about 13.7 billion years ago. I'd like to know how they know that. <laughs> That's a lot of years. 
But yet, that's what they believe. And I believe there was a Big Bang. I believe our Father spoke everything into existence. And I believe it already existed. It existed in the mind of God. And so, uh, in the realm of time then, what do we have? We have past, we have present, and we have future. And so the question I heard this morning is time and illusion. Now, what I'm talking about is time for me and you at illusion. I believe in time. I believe there are 24 hours in a day. And, but guess what? Who said how long a day is? <laughs> Who said how long a year is? Uh, aren't I, I think you've explained it to me. We talk about the black hole and all that. And, and a year out in space somewhere is a lot, a lot longer than a year here. Correct? And if I had time, I'd have you get up and explain all that to us. But physicists are very clear now. Time is not absolute. Despite what common human-minded uh, people tell you and me, time is relative. Time is flexible. Time changes. You know, again, uh, how, many uh, how many times a, a one planet goes around the sun that we could call that a, a day? would be shorter than how many times we go or longer or whatever. So the truth is we have, we have taken time and try to fit our being, right? And therefore we have entered into that realm of time. And again, time hinders us, but time was for the planet. So things happen. Uh, Albert Einstein said things happen when they happen and it's not the time which makes it happen. Things happen when they happen, but it's not time that makes it happen. Just like old age can come when you're 25 years old or 35 years old. You know, it depends on a frame of mind. I know people and have met people. I'll never forget a woman that I prearranged her funeral several years ago. She was 88, very young looking. She managed five or six different companies. She had all kinds of energy. And yet you can take somebody that's 25 or 35 or 45 and not be able to do near what she can do. And it has a lot to do with what's going on right up here. Right. A whole lot of what's doing going up there. So uh, time is like a stamp or of an event or a process that happens in the universe. It's just like, you know, it's like we have a passport and we travel sometime and they just stamp on there Italy or, or uh, Mexico or whatever. It's, it's like a stamp. But it really should not be something that affects us, and we should not be affected by past, present, and future. And yet, most of our lives, the majority of our conversation is about past, present, and worried about the future. Correct? So we give ourselves limitations. We give ourselves barriers that shouldn't be there. Particularly saying, I don't have enough time to do something. I believe, uh, I, I talk, I've talked in the past about how I believe Father enlarged my time many times. In my life, particularly in the beginnings when I did a lot of writing. Uh, if you could see what I've written, you know, I've showed some of you, but if you actually can see what I've transcribed and what I've studied and what I've written, and sometimes Donna can tell you it's hours, it's been in the past hours a day, six, seven, eight hours a day, and then go work on my job and then be part of my family. I, I, sometimes I really believe that I transcended time, not been much aware of it. But if I sat down with one of you and show you what I'd have done and say, you need to do this in this amount of time, you would say it's impossible, right? Because that's that limitation we have. But there's no limitations in the breath of God. No limitations living as spirit. You know, I'm going to keep saying spirit because it helps people understand. So we could say that our body aging happens not because of time, but because of awareness, because of our wrong awareness, if you would. So what we do is we allow time to impact us and to alter us. And we give into it because we agree with it. We agree that when we start hitting 60 and 70 and 80, these things happen. It's just, it's just what happens. You know, I, somebody said once, uh, I, where did I see it? I think I saw it at a physical therapy place. There was a sign, of, a picture of a woman that said, Growing old is not for sissies. <laughs> you know, we laugh about that and we identify with that, you know. But so we still think that we have all these false evidences that appear real to us and then we identify with those things. So 
There is not a day that goes by that we don't think of time and we don't think of age. Especially when you get around my age, you start my physical age. So how do we define time? Well, time is a component. I've looked a lot of this up on the internet. Time is a component quantity of various measurements and used to sequence events. Not us, but events. And to quantify rates of change of quantities and material reality or the conscious experience. So time in physics is unmistakably operationally and defined by what a clock reads. Right? So we look at it, what a clock reads, and we say it's 10 o'clock, it's, it's 10 15 or whatever. It's time, for bed. it's time for bed, time to get up, you know, mm -hmm. it's time to rest, <laughs> it's time to die, right? Well, they say that there's a time to live and then there's a time to die. Well, that's man's perception who, whose breath is in their nostrils, who gets their information from the sense realm. So I believe there were people that lived ageless. And I believe there still probably are people who live ageless. There has to be because when people left their bodies, their physical bodies here, they're in eternity. And there is no age there. And I do believe there are people that took their bodies with them. And I believe there's people that step back with their bodies and they live ageless. I believe Jesus appeared in a, in a, in a particular time period to wake people up to the truth, the gospel. And then I believe he stepped back out of that realm again. I believe that with all my heart. So, uh, I know I'm not going to pronounce this right, but Hippocrus, or, or, or hip, it's H-I-P-P-A-R-C-H-U-S, and other Greek astronomers employed astronomical techniques to measure the time that previously was never measured before. I've never seen this before, but I've, I found it. And it was developed by the Babylonians. And what does Babylon mean? Confusion. Confusion you know? And so uh, they resided in Mesopotamia, and the Babylonians made this astronomical calculation uh, a system that was inherited by the Sumerians, and it developed about 2000 BC, and that's when they began to measure time, around 2000 BC. That's what I found on the internet. And people existed without an Amer awareness of time before that. What year? 2000 BC. What did they do? They just lived and moved and existed. It's like I say this all the time. Larry, if you grew up in far uh, northern Montana, out in the wilderness, and there was no internet, there was no TV, there was no news came there, no knowledge of what the world thinks about about time, wouldn't you just exist? And you think your life would be different? That's right. I know you. That's why I said it for you, because you would love that. But, but you, would, you would just exist, and you wouldn't be thinking about, well, what am I going to do tomorrow? What do I need to do next week? You would just exist every day and enjoy life. And so I believe there were people that did that before. So I've often been told, uh, you know, uh, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but I want to talk about what Newton said. So is time uh, abs absolute or is it not? Is time absolute? Does, are we absolutely bound to time? Are we absolutely supposed to get old when we get 60? Are we absolutely supposed to start wrinkling? And are we absolutely supposed to die? No. no. Remember the man that came to prearrange my funeral? He was a preacher and he had cancer. I didn't know the man, but I just felt real empathy for him. And I wanted to minister to him and share with him and pray over him. He said, no. He said, how else will I ever get to heaven? You know, and his belief system is we have to die so we can experience heaven, so we can see Jesus, so we can see God. And so he was believing a great lie because he could experience what Jesus came to teach right then. And if he needed to talk to Jesus, he could. I mean, I tell people all the time, if you want to say Jesus, go right ahead. But I'm telling you, Jesus came to point us to the Father. <laughs> it's right now. And so, according to Newton, absolute time exists independently of any perceiver. Independently of the perceiver. I can perceive time. I can see time. I, I mean, I can know what time is. I can see the sun go up and go down. And I know when it's going down, it's becoming evening time and all that. I can see the seasons. But it literally it exists independently of me. It should not affect me. I know people probably think I'm crazy. 
but at a consistent pace throughout the universe, time does work, but it shouldn't change me. So yes, time is real. However, time should never affect, it should never influence, it should never impact, it should never alter, it should never change, it should never disturb, and it should never involve humanity whatsoever in our living and moving and existing as the face of God. It shouldn't change me. So I've been told many times myself that I'm ahead of my time, you know, because of what I teach. I don't believe I am. I believe I'm just right where I need to be at. I believe a lot of people are behind time, <laughs> if you would. There are, and that's not an insult. There's a lot of ministers out there are way behind where I'm at in my understanding. It doesn't put me, you know, haughty. I, I'm not saying I'm better than I'm just, I'm, I'm a little bit further ahead of my understanding where a lot of people are. K is too. There are many people there. A lot of scientists were way ahead of other scientists. Remember the gentleman back during uh, the Civil War that discovered germs. He was way ahead of his time because all the doctors before, they thought he was crazy. You know, I'm watching a show on TV right now and the people are getting the Spanish flu and I'm watching them walk around and touching them and, and you know, breathing their coughs and they pick up their napkins, got blood on it and touch it with their hand where they're, they're kind of behind time. <laughs> And that's why it was spreading so, because they didn't know about germs. They didn't know how things spread. And so today, we're, and I can say me, Kay, Don Keithley, many other ministers, I hate to start naming them because somebody's going to get upset, but many, many, many ministers out there are ahead of where a lot of people are at right now. Because we're discovering that our conscious awareness is powerful, and we're discovering that our conscious awareness needs to be renewed by leaning to this spirit of God, to the mind of God, to the breath of God for all understanding. And we're saying, come up hither. <laughs> you know, you don't need to wait there. You don't need to catch the germs of rel religiosity. You don't need to succumb to that anymore. You can rise up and be who you are. So uh, there are much truth teaching and, and wisdom that needs to be taught. And I desire to continue to be a part of that. And I know you do too. But paying, paying attention to time brings stress in people's lives. Correct? Mm -hmm. Much stress in people's lives. They say, I don't have enough time. So we've been taught, if you would, a religious bedtime story for thousands of years. And this false story has kept us asleep to the fact that we are ageless. We've been taught that we're just humans. We've been taught that we're sinners. We've been taught that we're sinners saved by grace. We've been taught that we're going to die and we're going to go to heaven someday and everything's going to be wonderful there. And the list can go on and on and on. And so we have identified with time. And Apostle Paul said, we must wake up to our true existence. I'm paraphrasing, but he said it was high time to wake up. And time was never our field or our constraint because our source and our existence is the ageless one. Just like poverty should never be part of my life because I'm in tune with the one that says, I've given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. I'm in tune to the one that owns it all, right? I'm in union with that. So sensory-minded people put God over there and us over here, right? God's out there. We're down here. God's on a big throne someday. We're going to get to see him. We're all going to bow before him and confess that he's, you know, and all the stuff we've been told that we're going to do someday. Uh, but divine, infinite, omnipresence was literally deleted and we didn't understand what omnipresent meant. In other words, God's everywhere. God's your breath. He's not just as close as your breath. God is your breath. Correct? And so they gave God toenails, teeth, white hair, knuckles, and elbows, and feet, and everything else. And Paul talked about it in Romans, and I translate it, where they made him like the animals. And they worshiped, they worshiped the creature and not the creator. And again, worship means to ascertain, seek, and desire to know, right? And then praise means to tell the story. This morning, I didn't, I didn't go into this scripture a lot, but I, I just heard, let everything that has breath tell the story. <laughs> That's what it means, praise God. Tell the story of God. And yet most people, they didn't tell the story of God. They told their perception of God. And again, they made him like an animal or a creature or a statue or something like that. And so they seated him on a marble chair and they made God like a man with an ego nature, me, myself, and I. 
So the following that I'm going to read right now uh, comes from the Nag Hammadi Library. It was discovered in 1945, and it's called John's Secret Gospel, and I have it. And this is supposed to be Jesus uh, speaking to John the Apostle, and it's, I think it's very satisfying when I read it. You know, you can believe it or not. You know, most people don't want to think that Jesus spoke to anybody after the cross, but I happen to tell you, he appeared to the Apostle Paul, didn't he? <laughs> Where did you think that happened from? It wasn't from a megaphone way up on a planet called heaven somewhere. Jesus literally appeared to him. And that appearing, that light knocked him off of his horse. And that horse is a type of his religious mindset that he had. And he was a wise man. He said, Lord, who are you and what do you want me to do? You know, and I preached a whole sermon on that once. We need to say that ourselves. Lord, who are you and me? And what do you want me to do in my life? So I believe this. It says, lift your mind to comprehend the things I now speak to you. And, and th this was Jesus talking to John. And please share all this with your spiritually endeavoring companions. In other words, those who are seeking the breath of God. Who are from the, from the sublime, unalterable race of humanity. See, we, if we would not let time be a power, we are unalterable. God made us what? Perfect, Right? With everything, Peter said, with everything that pertains to physical life and spiritual life, something came and altered that. And it's our identification with time and everything else that we've been taught. The one is the supreme sovereign of all, existing with nothing before it. And again, when I say it, I'm talking about breath of God. I'm talking about God. It is more than a God because we have this perception. That's why I don't like to use the word God. I say father. I say creator what I say. The only reason I say Father is because God, our Creator, whatever, was the Father of all mankind. Yeah. Male or No male nor female there. The one is the Father of all, the invisible one that is over all, who is imperishable and is the pure light that no sensory eye can see. You should not think of the one like a God or as a God with aspects of ruling because it has no rulership, Lord over associations with its loving self. The one doesn't exist with anything which would be inferior to it, since everything exists only within and by his mind. Our creator is eternal and does not need anything to be added. The one is absolutely complete and has never lacked anything to be its transcendent completeness. It has always been absolutely whole in its infinite pure light. It is illuminable since there is nothing to limit it. And we're in union, right? It is unfathomable since there's nothing that can or will fully fathom out it. In other words, God is so big, we're never going to fully understand God. Just like the Bible says, we're never going to fully understand the massness of the revelation that Jesus revealed to us because it just goes on and on and on. It is immeasurable since there's nothing to measure it. It is unobservable since nothing can observe it in its invisibility. So see, I cannot see breath, but I know breath is there. Just like Jesus talked about it. Of course, they said spirit, but you can't see spirit. It's like the wind. It goes, it comes. I can't see wind. I can see the results of wind. I can see how it causes the leaves to move and buildings to fall down, but I don't see the wind itself. There's no way of seeing it. And that's the way the breath of God is. It is eternal existing eternally without boundaries. It is un, uh, unutterable since nothing can comprehend it or its being to utter. It is unnameable since there's nothing above it to give it a name. And so that's why I don't like to say God because then I make it like a something we have to bow down and worship. It is the immeasurable, immeasurable light, pure, holy, invisibly blazing everywhere. It is the perfect in its un, unutterable imperishability. So how do I see our father? I see my father by looking at you. I see my father by looking at a baby. I see my father looking at creation. The whole earth reveals our father, right? Everything does. The sky does. The planets do. Everything, everything known or unknown reveals father. And it's not part of some perfection, like perfectly expressed, or some blessedness, like sublimely manifest, nor some divinity shining like a statue or a creature or, or just Jesus by himself. 
And see, what we tried to, man has done is made Jesus God. And so we, so we have our songs, more like you. We want, we, we want to be like Jesus. We already are like Jesus. Jesus was our elder brother, if people like to hear that. Jesus was here to teach us and explain his truth. And he said, uh, uh, was it John, let the same mind be in you? You know, he, so we, we let it. It's already there. You know, he didn't say, go get it or earn it. He said, let this same mind be in you. Let it work. Let it flow. The one is an, an infinitely greater and beyond all these, yet it is not measurable. Because we, you know, we try to put a limit on it, right, on it, on God. We, God loves you, but, like Kathy Walker said, you know, what you believe is comes after your but. Mm -hmm. You know, God will always be there for you if you serve him. And God will bless you if you tithe to me. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. The list can go on and on and on. It is neither corporal or incorporal, neither is it small or large. It is not expressed, so we might say it is this much or say it is this type. No one can understand it or define it, describe it. It is not one of the things, one of the things in existence. It is everything. It's not just one thing. And yet we want to make it one thing. We want to make God a Christian. How did he become a Christian? Did he get saved? <laughs> yeah. We want to make God a, a Buddha. We, we have all these statues and that becomes God and people go and they bow down. Is that burning? Yes. Donna, oh. turn that. What happened? Well, it came on and it went off. Flip, flip, something's wrong with that. Flip the switch off, baby. I saw that. I saw that happen yesterday too. We need to have that serviced. Mm -hmm. The fireplace. I don't like it just coming on on its own. Mm -hmm. That tells me gas is coming out. All right. So where am I at? Okay. Let's see. Uh, so it's not part of some perfection or some kind of divinity that's shining. It's not something that we go to and bow, and it's not something that we go seek in a place wherever, right? No. The one is infinitely greater beyond all these things. And again, it's not measurable. It's not corporal or incorporal. It's not small. It's not large. It's not a type. It's not a religion. When I'm saying it, I'm talking about our creator. It's not a religion. It's not a creed. It's not anything that man whose breath in his nostrils has named it. And yet people worship it all over the world in false images and false ideals. Correct? This is good. It is existence itself. What is God? God is existence. That would be a good answer. And gives itself. It is not something to be described as greater than. How can God be greater than you when you are God? You're the very image of God. How can my left arm be greater than my right arm when they're both me, my leg? How can I be a greater American than you are, are, are an American? We're all great. America is great. And we are all great. But yet we want to define greater and lesser. I'm better. You're worse. You know, I'm watching that show and I'm really enjoying it. But Downton Abbey. But you have these people who are wealthy and, and you have people who are servants. So the servants have to say, yes, Lord. Yes, my Lord. And they have all these titles they give them because... Because they have wealth for some, and they're, they've got this blood in them, you know, then all of a sudden they're greater. There's no one greater, and there's no one less. It is in itself, its allness, and is behind and beyond all, as it is not a part of the realm of this expressing, nor any sequence of time or its temporary aspects. Time was never its field or its constraints. And that's from the book of Thomas. And I love it. I think it's awesome. The book of Thomas. So I say, what folly, and I've, I've read some of that, and some of it I don't quite get, and I just kind of put it on the shelf, but I find a lot in there that I really like, and I enjoy it. And that's why I share it with you. But I say, what folly to put a limit upon the offspring of our creator. It's just really silly to put a limit on there. 
you know, uh, I think of President Donald Trump, and I love President Donald Trump. I pray for President Donald Trump, and I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, I think he's doing wonderful things, but he's worth a lot of money, and he has children that are in total union with him. And what folly would it be for us to say his children don't have a right to live that life? They're of their father. Well, they didn't earn it. They didn't do what he did. They're of their father, you know. And so we must not allow a perceived finite awareness to function for it would always limit our father. Because if we limit ourselves, we limit our father. When we say, I can't, that's one thing I've, Donna can tell you, I've railed on her for years and I shouldn't, but I, I can't stand to hear somebody say, I can't. Yes, you can. Just because you don't want to, just because you've never done it before, doesn't mean you can't do it. I've not hit a hole in one before, but if I would golf enough, I probably would hit one. I came about that close to one one time. You know, the biggest bass I ever caught once was a little over seven pounds. And I could have sat there and said, that's the biggest I'm ever going to catch. But guess what? I kept fishing a few weeks ago or a month ago, caught one over eight pounds. I, can I catch a 10 pound? Sure. If I just keep fishing, there's nothing you can't do. Except for we have that word can't drilled into our heads all the time. You can't give up. Huh? You can give in to can't. That's right. You can give in to it. You sure can. You know, it's just like golfing. I, because I had to have an artificial knee, and my mindset is I can't golf anymore. But I bet there's people that have artificial knees that golf. <laughs> sure they are. Sure there are. So we don't want to put a limit on us. And, and what we do is we're putting a limit on the offspring of our creator of ourselves, but also of our, our offspring, which are the offspring of our creator. And we put limits on them. We put limits on ourselves because we say, well, my mom is poor. My dad's poor. So I'm going to be poor. Mom has got a big butt. I got a big, daddy's got a big butt. I'm going to have a big butt. <laughs> right. Remember the big butt family? We had a full gospel assembly. So we don't want to allow this perceived inf a finite awareness to function in us. And that's what carnal awareness is. It's finite. There's an end to it. There's only so much we can do. There's only so much we can believe. Just like when they uh, got the gas engine, they put them in cars. They believe that if you went more than 20 miles an hour, you ever heard this, Quaid? That your face would burn off. <laughs> I was watching uh, <clears throat> that show again, down Downton Abbey, and this... Uh, guy that drove cars for him what, what do you call him a, a, a chauffeur chauffeur they asked him about his previous job why he left and he said well it was boring and they said what do you mean he said well she has the owner she had a beautiful car but she'd only let me drive 20 miles an hour and it was boring and i was thinking about that this morning are we bored with life because we've been limited i think so i think the reason most people are bored today is because they've been limited we think we're bound to our retirement money. We think we're bound to Social Security. We think we can't do anything anymore. And I'm telling you, my Bible tells me that I could do all things through the breath of God that strengthens me, that empowers me. We can do that. But yet we get bored. You know, the first time the guy got in the car, if he'd never driven before, five, ten miles an hour would be pretty cool. I don't know how fast we ride a bicycle, but you think it's five or ten miles an hour? It could be. Oh. Yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. How about back then, though? <laughs> I don't, but I'm just saying, if you're, if you're used to walking one mile an hour and all of a sudden there's a vehicle that could, you, can, you can ride and you can go five miles an hour, that would be fun. But after a while, you want to go faster than 10 miles an hour. And then, wow, I can go 20 in this. I'm sure he was excited about it. But after a while, it got boring because he knew in his heart that that car could go 30, 40, 50 miles an hour. And if you know it can go faster, but somebody's limited you to it, then it is boring. So we've had great lives, but I have to say it, they're boring compared to what we can do. Carl and Ann and me and Donna, we love cruising. We think it's awesome. But there are other people that say, nah, I don't want to do that. And I would just think, well, what a boring life they live. They've never been on a cruise. <laughs> I, people tell me all the time they don't vacation, I think. And I'm, I'm just using that example, but they've limited themselves. This world is for us to see. You don't have to have a lot of money to go on vacations. You can take a two or three hour trip and go on a vacation. You can just go to your state. But there's people set at home because their mindset is, I can't afford to go on a vacation. 
I don't have time, and on and on and on. So we limit ourselves by time. So what folly again is it for us to put a limit on the offspring of our creator? And that's what we've done. So what a man stops to reason, he finds himself, or when he stops to reason, excuse me, he finds himself chained to that earthen realm of fours that I talked about last week, that we're chained to it, we're limited to it. And we're afraid to travel the world right now. Many people are because of all the horrible stuff that's going on in the world, right? You know, I've, I've said that I'll never go to Mexico again, and I love Mexico. But because of what's happened recently, there's an there's a unhealthy fear there. You know, that family that went there and they, they killed the babies, they killed the mothers. It's horrible. Just really close to our border. And there's so much stuff that's going on in the world that we, I, we, we fear it. And the whole world's in fear right now. And then we have two political parties right now that's in fear. One's afraid that the president's <laughs> going to get elected. The other one's afraid that uh, he might not get elected. And it's just everything's based on fear. And so this earthen realm has cribbed us, if you would, into carnal imaginations and fears. And a crib is what? It's a baby bed. And it's kept us in a baby bed. For fear rules all people that are not governed by the holy breath of God within. If you're carnally mindful, what did Paul say to be carnally mindful? He did not say to have a carnal mind. Nobody has a carnal mind. But if we're mindful of carnal things, then what is it? It is death. And time is a carnal thing. I've never heard anybody say this. And I'm sure people are just kind of smiling at me and thinking maybe, boy, Roy's going off. the. But it is a carnal thing. Because it's not spirit, it's not breath, it's not eternal. It's limited to hours and days and months and years, correct? That's a limitation. And we're not limited to minutes, seconds, hours, months, and years. We just have been taught that we have. And I've, I've been there too. I mean, I'm, I'm 69 and, and I try to cast those vain imaginations down, but I'm thinking, oh my gosh, next year I'm going to be 70. And I know Kay has a lot of hard time with that, Kay Fairchild, because she's much older than I am. She just had a birthday, so <laughs> now we're supposed to laugh. She's laughing. <laughs> she's not much older. But, but you think that way. You think, oh, my gosh, I'm going to be 70, and odds are, according to time, I may have only 20 years left to live, right? Those thoughts can be there. And then all of a sudden, they can become fear, and then I can start living that way, and then I can start being careful, right? And, and you know, the, the, Bible, the word be careful means be fearful. Did you know that? When you tell people to be careful, you're telling them to be fearful. Well, why do I have to be careful? I'm all right. Why can't I go somewhere? Because I'm fearful or I'm aware and I, I'm aware of my physical body to the point that I limit myself and say I can't do that. And people will even look at you and say they can't do that because of how you present yourself. So how many times have you heard people say, I can't do this or I can't do that? And so what are they doing? They're putting a boundary and they're putting a limitation on ourselves. And our father goes far beyond all sense knowledge. And if we wait for human minded understanding, we will die in our waiting and in our religious superstitions. Because most religion is nothing but superstition. It was superstitious for us to believe if I didn't put 10% of all my money in the offering plate that I would be cursed. That's, that's, that's superstition. It's believing I can do something to cause a curse to come on me. Is that not superstition? You know, like don't, don't walk under a ladder. You know, that's superstition. Don't spill salt, all that stuff. And the church really taught us, religion taught us a bunch of superstitious stuff that wasn't true. All that our Father is, is contained in each one of us, and we do lack nothing. It's not something that's cute that we say, we lack nothing. Nothing. We, we do not lack health. I'm not trying to get health to come to me. I'm trying to get my brain to identify with that and draw from the health that's within inside of me. So the only barrier and only boundary are what we wrongly believe and what we, then what we, what we wrongly see. Because I, if I believe I'm supposed to get old, then I'm going to see myself as old, right? I don't, I, in the kingdom of God, seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. 
What you believe, you see. Quite if you believe that your papa doesn't love you and doesn't care for you, then you're going to see that in every action that I do. And it's not true, but that's how you see it. I've had people look at me many times because I didn't always have a natural smile. My, I, you know, I, I didn't know I wasn't smiling. And sometimes when I said I'm like this, Donna points it out to me all the time, but they look at me and say, he's not a friendly person or he's mad or he's upset when I'm just as happy as I can be. The joy of the Lord is all over me, but people are perceiving. And so they believe it and then they see it all the time. So the heavens and the earth are ours to tend to, and the heavens and earth are ours to enhance. We can fully live, we can take our liberty, and there's no limit to our progress and to our expansion. Think about this. I was thinking about this this morning. All modern conveniences today and modern science and understanding has come about in the last hundred years. Has it not? In the last hundred years. I mean, I believe that taps directly into the fact that there's a lot of tremendous revelation knowledge that's come forth in the last hundred years. I have old books back in the 1800s where people were tapping into these truths we're teaching today, but they mixed it with what with their old religious. They still believed in the devil. They still believed in the rapture. They believed that Jesus needed to come back and do something, but they also would teach who we are or whatever. But just think of the the technology and the sciences and everything that's come with what could happen if we could all let go of all the superstitious religious stuff that we've been taught, let go of our belief in God as some kind of creature out there, some kind of being that we bow down and worship, let go of the belief of hell and devil and demon, let go of the belief of, of opposites, that you're this and I'm this, you know, I'm let go of all that. I'm telling you, we can tend this earth to the point that there is an expansion take place that we never dreamed possible, and that's where we don't need medicine. We don't need, me, uh, we don't need medical miracle. We don't need healings. We, don't, we, we literally live out of the isness of God. I mean, doesn't that make sense? And it can happen very fastly. So again, think how far man has come thus far, mixing it with carnal knowledge. If we let go of the carnal knowledge, how much further can we go? Light years. Of course, that's time too, isn't it? So what would the planet be like if we fully lived out of our spirit, out of the breath of God? What would the planet be like if we tended it and did what we're supposed to do? There would be no storms. There would be no tornadoes. There would be no hurricanes. There would no be fi no fires burning up California and other places. There would be no people dying with sickness and disease and poverty and all that. Well, you know, people need to die because there won't be room on the planet. Oh my gosh, this planet's so big. We, we, we try to make this planet our size. This planet is huge. There's enough land in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Alaska that every person in America could have one acre all to themselves, just in Alaska. And so instead of expanding our universe, instead of, see the universe is expanding on its own because it's obeying the word of God, but we have limited our planet. We've made it so small and so uh, liable to die. We've made the planet mortal that we're saying, oh my gosh, because my cows are out there farting, the planet's going to die. Because we all have a carbon footprint and the planet is going to perish and we limit what God said that it would exist forever. And yes, we need to heal our planet. We need to take care of our planet. But the greatest way we need to heal our planet is to tend it and to, and to be the breath of God in it, and to bless it, and to speak the perfection in it that it is. Not just don't throw a cup on the ground. Throwing a cup on the ground is not going to destroy the planet. It will make it dirty, you know, and it won't make it look pretty. But I'm telling you, we can tend this earth, and we can call the expansion to take place, and I believe it with all my heart. Uh, we are matured, if you would, with all the fullness of our Creator when we, when we let God be God inside of us. When we let God do in us what God wants to do through us. In Revelation 10, 
Uh, I mentioned this when I started. A messenger vowed uh, by our Creator, swore by our Creator, who exists apart from the measurement of time, who created everything, and he said, there exists time no more. There exists time no longer. The word time here is chronos, meaning a space of time by implication of delay. In other words, this messenger saw, Larry, where time would no longer delay us, where time would no longer hold us back. And I, I know we sit there and hear it. It sounds good. Man, I wish it was true. I'm telling you, it is true. But this, this time is right here. It's not a measurement of time like tomorrow you're going to grab hold of this. It's, it's when you will agree with it, when I will agree with it. When I will agree there is no more delay. The messenger was not talking about physical time as how we measure seasons, days, months, and years. He was talking about a, a delay or a measuring of time that has caused us to allow the barrier and the boundaries. He, he, he was talking, because there will always be time, physical time, but there will, no, there will not be time and how it affects us if we quit allowing it to affect us. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a paradigm shift, right? It's going to take a guarding my lips what I say about time and my eyes what I see about time and my ears what I hear about time where time's running out. I remember as a young, young child, I heard that they had discovered that the sun was going to burn up and be non-existence a million years from now. <laughs> and I, you know, as a kid, it was kind of, oh my gosh, you know, but, but that's what people do. They place fear into people's lives. And today we have children in school, and Quade can attest to this, that have been taught a lot of fear. I'll never forget one day, and I was in the car with Camille. She was a lot younger, my granddaughter, and I was drinking water out of a plastic cup, and I threw it in the trash can. I didn't throw it on the ground. I threw it in the trash can. She started crying. I just started crying, and I said, what's wrong, baby? She said, you're, st you're destroying the planet, Papa. And they begin to teach them in school, and they do they're all kinds of stuff that's convincing them that us old people are going to destroy their planet, and they're not going to have a planet to live in anymore. Am I not correct? So this is, a, this is eternal mastership. I put dominion, but I change it. It's eternal mastership for those who live as son or live as the breath of God. We can master over this earth. We can bring this earth back into its right place. Because Father has placed the reins in our hands. You remember Brother Garner teaching on this once and, uh, in chapter 10, where it said time exists no more? He said, he interpreted as the, the throttle was in your hands. What we're doing is we're sitting in a car and saying, oh God, make this car go faster. Oh God, make this car go faster. Please God, make it go faster right? And like, oh, Father, make, make me well. Father, make me wealthy. I mean, we're, we're the, we put the throttle back in God's hands and God put it in our hands. God said, be the masters over this earth, rule and reign this earth, and take dominion, which means master, tend the earth. And what do we do? All of our prayers is, God, would you do this? And God, would you do that? And it's really foolish. It really is. And we've done it in every area there is. We go to doctors for doctors to do what God did. We go to bankers to, to do what God did. I mean, the list can go on and on and on. We're Father's products. We're, we are the execution of His Word. We're the execution of His very imagination, what God imagined. We're the execution of that. There's no heights, there's no depth to holy breath, for it is... Uh, it is the measureless life of our Father. There's a word uh, it's spelled A-E-O-N-I-A-N, -N, and it's actually eon. That's, that's life that cannot be measured by time, length, or size. That's the life that we have. We don't have just physical life. We have eon, E-O-N-I-A, -E 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 eon, eon. And it can't be measured by time. It can't be measured by length. It can't be measured by side, it, size. It's without beginning or end. It has no heights, no depth. It fills all dimension and fills all space. There's no place that 
eonon, life is not. That's the life that we have. It's a never-ending life. So one must enter the rest of being who they be and relax uh, his conscious mind for it to be who he is. We have to relax our mind. We have to cause our, our awareness, our brain to, to relax and enter into the rest of God. And that rest of God is knowing that you have everything already. I mean, Norma, I don't know how much money you have, and I don't want to know, and I don't know what your financial condition is after WD. I'm sure it's a little different than it was before. I'm sure you have to sometimes watch your money a little bit. I know you, 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 you know what I, you, what, I, what I believe, and you believe that you'll never lack. But if somehow or another, $20 million came into your lap, would you rest from that fear? You would. You would rest from it. I mean, naturally, you would rest from it. I'm not going to have to worry about money anymore. I mean, I'll never forget. Donna doesn't like me talking about it much, but when her mother died, she left us over $100,000. And I had a $25,000 life insurance policy on her to help me settle her estate and everything. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm never going to have to work again. <laughs> I did. I really did, didn't I, Donna? I thought, man, life is going to be great. I don't have to work anymore or I don't have to, you know, don't have to make much money. And Donna brought me down very quickly a month or so after that. And she said, we still have electric bill, gas bill, car bill. You know, we still have insurance. We, you know, she just went to this list and she ended up showing me that I need to bring home about $2,500 a month. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I, I left that realm of rest that I thought I had. <laughs> I'm just using that as an example. We're but No. I mean, no matter what you have, you still pay to survive. Oh yeah, you do. Yes. But but that that's the physical and that's that's what I'm talking about. And and I was just using that example. So if we could really tap into and I know most of us have, we can tap into this realization that there is nothing required tomorrow that's not going to be there. Nothing. I'm telling you, that is entering into the rest of God. And we've got to include that in more than just money. It's got to be in health. It's got to be in life. God created me to live forever. He didn't create me to die at 40, 50, 60, 70, 20, 18, 5 or 6 years old. When I look at these babies that are, have cancer and they're born with cancer, it's because the collectedness of mankind has passed that belief system down and it's allowed time to interfere with us, to hinder us, to change us from immortality to mortal, which is a liable to die mentality. So we've got to enter into this. In other words, if you relax and enter into the rest of being who you will, then time will no longer affect, alter, change, disturb, impact, or influence, or be a force on you. And that's what we've allowed time to do. Time has altered us, right? It's changed us. It's disturbed us. Time disturbs you, doesn't it? It impacts you. It influences you. And there, it's a force on you. And all that's illegal. And it's not part of people who are the light of the world. We are the light of the world, and we can go forth, and we can change the world. And I know this is a lot, and uh, you know I'm going to publish this book pretty soon, and I hope people will get it and go through it again and read it. But it, it's the truth. We're not preaching it to be the truth. It is the truth. I'm not trying to make anything true in your life. I'm telling you what is true in your life. And you are of the ageless one, and you are light. And everything that light, everything I've taught you about light, that's who you are today. And so... As long as we're bound by time, as long as we're bound by fear and all that stuff, then we are, we are involved in ego, me, and myself, and I. And we, we won't go help other people until we become better ourselves. And we already are. How many times have we heard people say, and I'll give once I start making enough money? That's ego, right? I'll go, the, I'll go the, to the sick and help them when I get well. It's always about me getting what I need, and then I'll go. But the truth is, you won't go, not if it's that mentality. Amen? So, I'm not sure if I'm done with this or not. I'll let you know next week. <laughs>
depends on what the Lord speaks to me to, to go on through with this. But I hope you've enjoyed it. I have. You know, I've heard all my life that I'm the light of the world. And uh, I, I told people, a lot of people didn't like it. But when, it, when Jesus said, when the scripture said that we are the, the, now the true light of the world is here, I, I just knew in my heart, that's us. Because Jesus was the only light of the world that experienced who he was. But he left. And later on, it said, now the true light. And people still want that to be Jesus because they want a God that they can worship, that they can bow down to. All along, God's in them, and they are, they are what they want to worship. That, isn't that cool? You are what you're ascertaining and seeking, desiring to know. So if you know you're of God, the way to find out who you are is ascertain and seek and desire to know God. And when you know God, then you can tell the story. I'm in his image. I'm the very same. There's no difference whatsoever. Amen? All right. God bless you. Hope everybody enjoys the day today. And all of you on here, thank you for being here. There's Teresa again. And you can't read that right there. Oh, David. David Kellerman. Good to see you on here. So bless all of you. And we'll see you next week. Okay. Yeah, we will.